What's up, guys, and welcome to the War Report, your source for Planet Side 2 news and action. I'm Alex Jax Conroy. I'm going to be uh, hosting the show today solo, but we do have Golden Boy joining us for some action later. Before that, I have an incredibly cool guest. I know you're all as psyched as I am, uh, Mr. Matt Higby from Sony Online Entertainment. Uh, Higby, how you doing? Good, man. How are you? Dude, I'm great. How, uh, how's uh, the beautiful San Diego weather? Uh, it's pretty nice out right now, I got to say. Awesome. So we have a lot of stuff to talk about. We have Game Update 9. But uh, diving right into it, obviously, MLG, it's a competitive show. We, uh, people have been asking me, what's up with the Battle Islands? When are we going to get them? And can we talk a little bit about them? Um, well, we've just finished up our design pass on our first Battle Island, uh, which we're calling the Nexus right now. And it's pretty neat. It's an ice continent. Um, it's a mini continent. And it has, uh, let's see, seven bases on it two warp gates and basically they're set up so that they uh it's very symmetrical um and it's designed to support the kind of scale of combat that we're trying to set up for the uh initial uh esports matches which means 48 on 48 um it's really cool it's a very interesting map it has some really cool base layouts to it um and we're really excited to get it out to people and, and let them start trying it out so this uh this battle on the next is Access to it, is that going to be controlled by SOE? Can teams sign up, wait in line, or can they just join it? Well, we're hoping to be able to use it as part of our global continental conquest kind of uh, map. It's going to end up being in the world as something that you can go fight on. It'll have a lower uh, population cap. Um, and obviously, it's set up to be a more of a 1v1 than a 1v1v1 type map. So um, our thought right now is it could be uh, an interstitial step between two major continents. Um, so two empires at any given time would have access to be able to fight on it. Uh, but our goal is absolutely to put these battle islands that we're creating for esports into the larger game and let people be able to play on them anytime they want to. Uh, that way the competitive players get a chance to understand the layout, know how the map flows, um, and everybody gets the enhanced benefit of having some new gameplay spaces with some pretty cool uh, new outposts and new strategic options on them. Very cool, dude, very cool. So a lot of the competitive players have been wondering, uh, in competition play, say MLG, are they going to be using uh, their characters from in-game, or is it going to be a stock character that they're assigned they can then sort out? So we want people to be able to use their characters because we want them to be able to use their names and sort of have their um, uh, the prestige associated with playing on their guy. So if you're fighting alongside of a dude you just saw win the MLG tournament the night before, uh, that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, so we want you to be able to use your character. However, your item unlocks is something that we're still working on uh, on getting an exact rule set for. So some of the things that we've been talking about are making it so that in the course of a match, you have a lot of uh, character advancement options that you can make. So maybe you start off um, basically like a new player with default equipment, but then you can very quickly unlock new items as you're running around and fighting throughout the course of a 45 minute match. Something similar to, uh, to what you would see in like a MOBA game. Dota or something where you're actually building your character during the match and how you build your character out is a big piece of how you are um, successful or not. And other things that we've talked about are just making uh, limited competitive equipment sets. So um, for instance, when you jump into the virtual reality training in our game, you have access to every single weapon. We could kind of create something similar to that where when you're participating in a tournament, you have access to a certain subset of weapons that have been deemed competitive and uh, are set up for specific competition rules um, that's similar to what tf2 does for competitive modes and, and that's another option that we've kind of been weighing very cool it sounds like you guys are, are spitballing some very cool ideas over there um now as far as 48 people that's obviously a lot of people uh do you see this happening on land we have 48 and 48 on land and getting all the teams there in person um well what we've kind of been talking about has been with 48 players you have a platoon which means you have four squad leaders plus a platoon leader and our thought has been that those leaders, the four squad leaders and the platoon leader, would be the ones that were physically present at events like MLG. Um, and the rest of the players would be kind of logging in and playing over the, over the net. Um, and all of those people would be in a uh, specific instance. They'd be playing in kind of a, their own gameplay space, so they wouldn't be getting interrupted. And we'd also be monitoring all of their connections really closely, um, all the characters that would be connecting from external we would be making sure we're you know weren't cheating or making sure that they had a stable connection to the server so that the other players there didn't have to worry too much about char characters warping around if they had an unstable connection etc 
Very cool. So you guys are working on anti-cheat for competitive play? Well, we're working on anti-cheating basically across the board um, and creating creating tools to help us more quickly identify and be able to deal with cheaters has been um, something that we've kind of had as a as a, a goal and, and a, a uh, something that we've been working against since the launch of the game. And we've gotten better and better and better at it. Um, you know, our, our time to identify and our time to ban um, people who are cheating in the game right now is, is pretty quick, at least compared to several months ago when it was taking us a little while longer to be able to identify those guys and get them out of the game. Yeah, I definitely think you guys have been solid on that lately. Um, so Planet Side being an MMO FPS, obviously a very unique genre. What uh, made you guys have the decision to venture into esports and go the MLG route rather than just having it be this large scale game like some other MMOs? So, I mean, for us, when we started working on this game, we wanted it to be a truly competitive gameplay experience. And to me, as a, as a big fan of esports, and there's lots of other people on the team and, and the company that are big fans of esports, we've kind of identified that the, the keys to being able to be a, a successful esport are having a really competitive game and having a compelling viewership experience. And we think that Planetside kind of offered both, but Planetside is a very different game to many other esports that people are used to seeing. So that's always been a hurdle that we've had to jump over is, is kind of getting people to wrap their head around the idea that the keys to Planetside 2 as an esports are being able to understand the team play behind it and the strategy that's unfolding. Not necessarily the, I mean, individual skill still obviously is, is very important within the within the moment to moment gameplay. Um, but you're looking at more than just the individual skill. You're looking at how is the battle plan unfolding? What type of what type of overarching strategy are these guys using to try to capture this location or to try to defend this location? Um, and I think that that can be really, really cool. And it's largely just up to how well we can contextualize that action and give meaning to it in the form of casters being able to explain what guys are trying to do and having good observer tools to be able to see um, the massive scale combat. But I think team play and communication and coordination and all of those things can be incredibly exciting to watch. And I don't think that esports need to look like the ones that we've already seen any more than NASCAR and golf and tennis and badminton and bowling need to look like each other. Those are all very different things, but they all still provide a compelling competitive viewership experience. Um, and I think Planetside 2 can do that in spades. So that's that's the main reason that we, we thought it was a natural fit. Um, Yeah, so there. absolutely. As a caster, you know, watching the dynamic of like 48 players and how they all work together, I find it very interesting and exhilarating. Um, so as far as competition goes, you're definitely going to be involved in MLG, which we're incredibly excited about. Uh, do you have any plans for like an online league segment, sort of online competition outside of uh, the MLG events, either through game battles or some other form of online competition? Well, we do. Um, we've talked a lot about setting up things where we actually have more weekly matches. Uh, you know, you'd see placement matches happening kind of more frequently. And then at the big MLG events, we would be having the, the larger kind of culminations of these tournaments that were happening throughout the seasons. Um, I think we're still working out exactly what the schedule is going to be for all that type of stuff. But it's absolutely our goal to try to um, allow for those competitive players to be able to have more than just once every quarter of an event to look forward to. Um, but at the same time, make sure that a lot of their success and their ability to participate in these events is based on how how much they play and how well they play the sort of macro game Planet Side 2 experience, the larger open world MMO experience. Um, we want to keep them really closely tied together so that we don't have people just suddenly disappear from the MMO game because they're off playing the tournament mode all the time. So we're trying to keep them as closely integrated as we can, but we want the competition side of the game to be available more than just once every three months at a big MLG event, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, so a lot of our outfits that are watching are preparing for MLG. They're very excited about competitive Planet Side 2. Uh, is there going to be an outfit member limit? Obviously, it's 48 versus 48, but is there a limit on how many members you can have uh, in your outfit to compete? No, uh, the way that we're building the the outfit uh, kind of ranking system is going to be flexible enough to be able to handle different sized outfits. And then the idea is that each one of the outfits, based on their ranking on the uh, global leaderboard, is going to be invited to send 48 players. And they'll, they'll have to have signed up and said that they actually want to participate uh, in the esports gameplay. 
but those that do and are ranked high enough on the leaderboard are going to be invited to be to participate in it and then they'll be able to just send their best 48 players so whether you're in a 500 man outfit or a 50 man outfit you'll still send your best 48 players and by the time you get into the competition you're going to be fighting against an evenly matched force very cool um, so moving out of the competitive sector for a little bit, the Harass is a new vehicle that was introduced to the game. Personally, my favorite vehicle. People are loving it. Uh, what is your next vehicle plan to introduce, or have you guys even thought of that? Yeah, uh, we've talked about a couple ideas for for new vehicles, uh, but we haven't really solidified what our next new vehicle is going to be. Um, one thing that is kind of a an ongoing goal for us is is every month we want to be doing a refresh of either one of our classes or one of our vehicles. So um, the next big vehicle refresh that's gonna be coming is gonna be for the Empire specific fighters. And those are gonna be getting some new, basically basically new abilities, new weapons, new cosmetics, similar to what we did with the, uh, uh, with the Flash, giving it a couple new abilities uh, and some new cool toys, like the Flash got the rumble seat and the Wraith module. Um, you know, we'll see similar kind of scope of additions to the ESF uh, in the ESF update. And then two months after that, we'll be doing another update. And I think right now, the one that's scheduled then is the Sunderer. Um, and then in between then, you'll see the Infiltrator get an update too. So it, we're, sometimes one of those updates will be a brand new vehicle. So the last thing that we did was add the Harasser and that's a brand new vehicle. And sometimes those will get inserted as a, uh, as a vehicle refresh or as a class refresh. But uh, those will be a little bit more rare because the amount of work it takes, as you can imagine, to release a brand new vehicle versus add some stuff for an existing vehicle uh, is quite a, bit, quite a bit more. Yeah, I imagine you guys have a lot of work over there. Uh, so we'd spoken a little bit earlier, and you're super stoked on Game Update 10. Can you tell us a little bit about what the quality of life update is and what you hope to address? Yeah, um, well, we're working right now on, on Game Update 10 and Game Update 11. And Game Update 10 is going to be coming next week. Uh, it's going to be a relatively small update. It's going to be containing a lot of features that uh, aren't necessarily for our current players, but they're more for partners and for things that we're doing we externally. Um, but it's going to come with some cool stuff too. Uh, for instance, it's going to have new alert types that people will be able to play. Uh, so instead of just having the capture the continent alerts, there'll be some new alerts for capturing all of the amp stations in the world, cap capturing all the bio labs in the world, uh, those type of things. And uh, we'll have some bug fixes, obviously some, some new items coming out with it. But then game update 11 uh, is gonna be our quality of life update. So I'm really excited about this one. Basically what we've done is we've solicited feedback from players and found, um, well, we've asked them to send us their top issues, their, uh, their number one things that are pissing them off about the game, things that they feel like need to be made better, bugs that they're running into all the time, or even just little areas where they feel like a small change can make a big enhancement to their gameplay experience. And we've compiled these lists. Um, we've found over over all the different a avenues that people have given us uh, given us the feedback. We found the ones that have been mentioned the most and have been brought up the most. And we're in the process of figuring out how we can fix as many of these as possible for game update 11. And that update is purely going to be a adding adding fixes based on things that players have uh, have explained to us that they want. Um, we're not going to be putting any brand new features in. We're not going to be throwing any uh, you know crazy new gameplay content in. It's mostly going to be just polish and cleanup of uh, of issues. So I'm, I'm super stoked about that. I feel like that's something we've been wanting to do for a long time, um, and I'm excited that we're getting to it. Very cool. Yeah, you guys have been doing a great job, I think, of, of taking community input, and your team over there has been doing a great job of, of really integrating that in the game. So uh, kudos to that. So let's talk uh, Hassan. When are, what are we going to see Hassan? Can we talk a little bit about what it's going to look like and uh, some more details on that? I sent a, a screenshot of Hassan out on Twitter the other day. Yeah, check it, it was, out. It's, uh, it's cool. <laughs> it was inside of a amp station, so it didn't, people didn't appreciate it very much, I think. But, <laughs> um, yeah, so Hassan is... It's coming along really well. It's, uh, I say this every time we release a new continent, but it's gonna be our best continent. We've, uh, we've gone through and we've taken a lot of learnings and lessons that we've, we've kind of hard earned through, <laughs> through uh, our other continents. And uh, we've integrated all those lessons and teachings into, uh, into Hassan. Uh, so I'm really excited about some of the concepts that the level designers have come up with in there. Um, it's cool, it's gonna be a very different 
kind of experience, I think, than the other continents are. It's very lush. There's a lot of vegetation, a lot of tree cover, um, a lot of very large canopy trees. So you can almost imagine it like a swampy, almost rainforesty um, continent. So from the perspective of, of aircraft, it's going to be challenging for you to um, to fly underneath the canopy of these trees. It'll add a little bit of extra um, gameplay for for pilots to be able to, to get in close enough to bomb the shit out of dudes on the ground. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. It has for vehicles kind of specific locations where um, where vehicles are able to have large open field vehicle battles, but also areas where when you get closer to the bases, there's more sequestered infantry combat areas. So infantry players have a little bit of an easier time um, having infantry versus infantry fights without being uh, being as worried about vehicles in those specific locations. Anyway, I'm really excited about Austin. I think it's going to be really cool. Hopefully, we can start showing people some of that um, in the very near future. In the very near future. But <laughs> um, we're still holding off a little bit, getting some more art polish in, and waiting on getting some things finalized with the Interlink facility, which is one of the key features of Austin, uh, is a new facility type as well. So that interlink facility is one of the last things that's getting finished up. And then as soon as we have all that stuff ready to go, we'll be popping it on test server and letting people run around and check it out. Can we talk about that new facility for a minute? Just what it's going to look like, what, what its uh, abilities are going to be? Yeah, it's, uh, it's another full facility. So it's about the, the same kind of scale as the tech plant or uh, the amp station is. Uh, the interlink facility is kind of a massive radar installation. So its primary purpose is for communications and uh, uh, coordination, and its benefits will kind of be along those lines as well. Uh, yeah, it has a lot more interior space than the other facilities do. It has a lot more um, of a kind of centralized infantry combat core, I guess, than the other facilities do. So we expect there to be uh, pretty cool infantry fights happening in that, in that uh, facility. And then of course, it'll be set up like our other facilities are where it's sort of the centerpiece of an installation. So around it, we'll be able to have variable walls and, and turrets and uh, kind of a little town that can spread around it. That'll be dynamic based on which interlink facility specifically you're fighting at. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's. I think people will, will really appreciate the work that's gone into it. It's been something we've spent a lot of time um, working on. Very cool. I know that uh, the guys uh, that I play with are really excited about both Haas and the Interlink facility coming out. So let's talk about the Lattice system for a minute. That came out on Indar. Uh, it's getting a lot of uh, positive feedback. Are you going to introduce that to all the other continents, or is it going to remain Indar specific? So the biggest single piece of work that goes into creating the, the Lattice, or that went into creating the, the Lattice system on Indar, was actually all of the base refreshes that we had to do along with it. Um, almost every single one of the outposts on Indar got touched in some way um, when we when we went through and made that change, and that was by far the biggest uh, the biggest outlay of of development time that we spent on implementing the lattice. Um, and we're working on that work right now for Esmir. So the lattice seems like it's going really well. Um, there's a lot of really cool big fights that are happening um, due to it. So we're pretty happy with the overall performance of it right now, and we're moving forward with getting it implemented on the other continents as well. But like I said, the biggest piece of that work is all the facility refreshes, and that takes a long time to do. It's not something that we can just turn it on quickly. If we just wanted to make the links between the bases set up, that would be something we could do really fast. But without the actual changes to the facilities themselves and to the outposts themselves, it would cause a lot of problems for us to just do that. Um, so once those facilities get their updates, then we'll, turn on Lattice on um, Esamir. And we're doing some other things too, like we're implementing dome shields on top of some of the facilities um, on Esamir right now. And we're talking about bringing those over to the other continents too and tying them to uh, either potentially facility benefits or objectives within the bases. So a lot of really interesting, cool things are sort of all happening at once with the, uh, with the facility layouts and with the Lattice. But to answer your question, because <laughs> I just ended up rambling about completely different stuff. But to actually answer your question, yes, it is coming to those other continents. Um, but how long it's going to take to get to those other continents is a factor of, of how long the refreshes on all the bases take uh, for us to complete. 
great. So it looks like you're working on that. And uh, let's take a minute and talk about faction balance. Uh, how do you decide, is the test server a huge determinant in faction balance, and how do you feel faction balance is right now in the game? Uh, no, the test server is not a huge uh, determiner for faction balance. Um, test server doesn't have the population for us to be able to make any real determinations on it. Um, the test server is great for us to find things that don't function correctly. Uh, but being able to figure out whether things are balanced or not, or overpowered or not on the test server is really challenging. Um, so what we do is we try to make sure that things are functional, you're not crashing, it shoots bullets when you pull the trigger, uh, the vehicle doesn't flip over and instantaneously blow up when you get it from a vehicle pad, that kind of stuff. Uh, those things are easy for us to find on the test server, and the test server has been really, really useful for us making sure that none of those kind of debilitating uh, gameplay bugs get to live, or fewer of those debilitating uh, gameplay bugs get to live. You never stop them all, but um, that's what the main purpose of the test server has been for us. Um, in terms of looking at faction balance, we do it against the live servers, and we look at it in different ways. We know that some servers have really, really strong outfits and really, really strong players on a certain empire. Uh, so that server can skew uh, towards TR looking really, really powerful on Matherson, for instance, or actually, actually they, they don't, the VS look really powerful on Matherson. <laughs> but uh, we, we, we look at that data and we kind of skew it and try to figure out where, um, where the real imbalance is, which is hard to find sometimes. Because we could have in the game a large imbalance uh, that shows up across all servers, or we can have a imbalance that is skewed so much by one empire on one server doing one particular thing, or even one outfit on one server doing one particular thing so much that it looks makes the balance data look, uh, look broken. So um, yeah, we largely look at it against live. We look at it globally against all live servers, but also individually against individual live servers. Uh, and we try to figure out the context behind why certain servers are behaving a certain way, why weapons are really, really uh, excelling on one server, but not another. A lot of times it has to do with the tactics that different outfits have been able to figure out on those servers. Uh, so it's it's really interesting and it's a really fascinating puzzle to get to work on every single day. Um, and it's a puzzle that I expect to continue working on every single day for years and years and years. <laughs> yeah, I see that whiteboard in the background. It looks like you, uh, you got a lot going on there. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That's an inside, inside look at the, insane shenanigans that go on on a day-to-day -day basis. So you're obviously super busy designing the game, overseeing pretty much all of it. Uh, you're this rock star in the community. Everyone knows Higby. Uh, do you have time to play at all? Yeah. Um, I try to do my best to play at least, you know, uh, six to seven hours uh, every week. I try to get two or three hour play sessions in on the weekends, and I usually jump in for an hour or two here and there. I'm absolutely not the most hardcore player in the world. Um, I jump around from character to character a lot. I don't really stick with one character very much, but largely I'm trying to figure out issues at a very low level with what is it like as a new player jumping in, trying to find a fight? What is it like on this server? What is it like on this other server? Um, what is it like as, as somebody who wants to, you know, play heavy assault and I'll jump in and play a character as a heavy assault for, I don't know, a week or two, um, concentrating on that and figuring out where it seems like the deficiencies are. So I do, I do get a chance to play. I don't get a chance to play as much as I want to. Um, and there are people on our team that are really, really, really hardcore players that get to play, you know, 20, 30 hours a week and they play on the same character. So they're involved in the really high level uh, outfit operations and um, they're great. And we get as much feedback as we can about what stuff's working and what stuff's not from those kind of, those kind of players on our team and externally too. Do you ever get to roll with an outfit yourself or do you mostly do solo play just to kind of concentrate on what's going on with the character? Say again, sorry, I didn't catch that. Do you ever get to roll with an outfit yourself and kind of experience that style of play? Oh yeah, for sure. No, I've jumped in with outfits a couple times. Um, I've contacted a couple of the big outfits and have been able to jump in and have some good play sessions with them. Um, you know, they've, they've always been really nice to me and let me come on either anonymously where the outfit leader doesn't tell everybody else that I'm playing with them. Um, and even a couple times I've jumped in and people have known that I'm in there with them. Um, and it's, it's super fun for me. It's tough though too, because you know, I, Ultimately, my job is to try to uh, maintain the entire game. So it's hard for me to just like have a character that I play all the time with a group of people that I play with all the time, because then it starts to skew my opinion about what things work and what things don't work. Um, so for me, I, I, I feel like I jumping around from character to character, playing really casually sometimes, also playing kind of a little bit more with hardcore players sometimes gives me the best possible look at 
all the different things that can be facing our players um, rather than you know playing playing my one character in a really hardcore way would very cool man so hopping back to the competition aspect of the game at SOE Live, which we'll talk about later in the show, I know you're giving out about $10,000 in prize money. Uh, can you tell us anything about what you have planned there as far as a competitive structure? Yeah, the, the tournament's going to be a six-on-six -six, um, tournament. Uh, teams are going to be able to be formed there, so they're going to be doing some team balancing there. Um, and it's mostly going to be fun, you know? When you're talking about people playing six-on-six, -six, it's not really planetside. Uh, it's some kind of thing that's, part, that's taking place within planetside. So it's mostly going to be an event for fun. Um, at SOE Live is kind of all about getting people together and getting a chance to talk to players, have old friends be able to meet with each other, and then you know, uh, it's it's just a really fun event. It's much much less of a serious business competition type event than a, a fun uh, kind of activity for people who are at SOE Live. It's almost a reward for the people who have come to SOE Live to be able to go participate in one of these events and maybe walk away with a thousand bucks. But I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to, uh, to necessarily say that it's a, a serious competition that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be there in SOE Live. Last year, what we did was a, um, an event where it, the entire point was to just get as many kills as possible within, I think, a three-hour period. So, not really representative of competitive Planet Side Two, but super fun to watch. <laughs> Yeah, I believe Delreth from DVS actually won that, so shout out to him. Um, yeah. So you said that you watch uh, StarCraft II, and that's why you were involved in MLG. Any, uh, you know, who's your favorite StarCraft II player, and is that what got you into esports? Is StarCraft II the game that got you into esports? Any specific StarCraft II what? Is, do you have any specific StarCraft II favorite player, and is that the game that got you into esports and developed your passion for esports? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I've been a StarCraft fan since I was a kid. Uh, StarCraft was one of the games that really helped define my kind of gaming life, I think, um, early on. StarCraft came out when I was like 14, I think, and I played the shit out of StarCraft. StarCraft and the original EverQuest, and probably Quake 2, if I were to name three games that, that really helped shape my, my gaming style, those would be the three. Um, but yeah, I, I, I like a lot of different players. Um, if I were to pick a favorite, I don't know. Tasia, I like a lot. Tasia's a really fun player to watch. Um, I'm more of a Protoss fan, so I like a lot of the um, the Western Protoss players. I really like watching Minigun a lot. Um, I like Grubby. There's there's so many of them that are that are really entertaining, great players. So it's tough it's tough to name just one. I I guess if I were to name one player that I think is the most entertaining to watch and the most fun to watch, as, as much hate as I would get for it, I would say it's Naniwa. His, his play style he's just always on the razor's edge of of just barely winning just barely losing he always makes such calculated risks and watching him play just keeps me on the edge of my seat all the time very cool man well hopefully we'll be able to add some uh, pro planet side two players to your uh, list of, of guys you like to watch so final question of the interview the most important question that every person's asked me when i've asked what do you want to ask higby uh dude what kind of shampoo do you use <laughs> all right what kind of shampoo? That's the most important question. What kind Super of shampoo? Super important. Like? Muy importante. I I use Head and Shoulders. Really? I spend, I spend zero time, zero time doing anything with my hair. I don't comb it. I don't condition it. I throw Head and Shoulders in it three times a week, and that's uh that's my hair care routine. Wake up looking like Bon Jovi. Well, Higby, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, being on the show. You're the man. Uh, you're doing a great job at Planet Side Two, and we absolutely can't wait for the change you guys have coming out. Thanks again. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Cool, guys. Well, that was Matt Higby. And uh, coming up, we're going to have some gameplay, which uh, should be pretty exciting. Golden Boy will be joining me. But uh, next, I think we have a clip for you to watch. Make sure you submit your clips at uh, majorleaguegaming.com slash submit. But uh, check out this clip. Generator stabilized. Enemy heavy, spotted. 